to the hills of North Georgia and to Road Atlanta. From England, home of traditional British racing green, the snarling V12 Jaguar XJR7. From Detroit, the turbocharged muscle of the Motor City, the Buick Hawk, the Ford Mustang Probe, and the menacing Corvette prototype. From the hills of Bavaria, home of German engineering, the newest member of the IMSA sports car family from BMW, and the patriarch of IMSA racing, the winner of 15 of 16 events in 1985, the Porsche 962. They have come here to the two-and-a-half-mile circuit of Road Atlanta, north of Atlanta, Georgia, in the heart of American Southland. After hours of practice and qualifying, mechanics have the cars ready to go. The drivers have come from across the world. They, too, are ready. The Corvette is on the pole, and we're about to go sports car racing IMSA style. Hello, everyone, and welcome to beautiful Road Atlanta in the hills of North Georgia. I'm Bob Barsha, welcoming you as well to our first ESPN telecast of International Motorsports Association Camel Grand Prix racing for 1986. This weekend is the Atlanta Journal and Constitution Grand Prix, 500 kilometers of racing for the fire-breathing prototype cars for a purse in excess of $175,000. The action should be intense, to say the least, and joining me to help bring it to you, it's a man who knows this racetrack well, Camel Grand Prix racer, Bill Adam. And Bill, we've seen some fantastic speeds out here in qualifying but we've also seen some wrecks your impressions of how the race will stack up well the road atlanta facility has a track that is one of the most difficult in north america that the camel gt series visits it will really benefit a team that's an expert in setting up the chassis doing the driving job and using the experience to make passes in the proper place because the circuit has such severe elevation changes, it really puts a premium on making safe passes, showing that even a team like Drake Olson and a very, very fine Porsche 962 can have one of those horrifying 200 mile an hour crashes. You have to be extremely careful out here, make passes with a great deal of caution, but be forceful at the same time. We'll be taking a closer look at the course in just a moment, but for now, let's go down to Pitt Road and Ron Kendrick. Bob, it's not surprising that the Chevrolet Corvette is on the pole here at Road Atlanta. They were on the pole at Daytona. They were also on the pole at Miami. But he's going to have a lot of competition at the start. Right alongside is Al Holbert. Further back, a lot of competitive cars. It's going to be a good race. Thank you, Ron. A record crowd in excess of 50,000 people on hand. But first, let's take a look at this two-and-a-half-mile Road Atlanta course, courtesy of our BF Goodrich Porsche 962. Bill, how about taking us around? A very, very fast course here, Bob. As we're coming down the street, entering turn one, we're reaching about 140 miles an hour, hard into fourth gear and up into this uphill sweeping right-hand corner. Foot to the floor, just a brief shot of full acceleration, down to third gear, down to second, a very tight right, squeezing on the gas, we're entering the S's. Down to these S's here, we pick up third gear, pick up fourth, and if the car's set up perfectly, you're running almost flat out through here at 150. Back down to the second gear for a tight left and gentle on the gas here before you're on to full throttle. Up to third, up to fourth gear, you're picking up almost peak RPM here, 160 miles an hour. We're hard on the brakes and down to third gear. Gentle on the gas up to here, just a brief throttle, full throttle, down to second gear, and here's the tightest corner in the track as we enter the long back straight. This is where the cars like our, our turbocharged Porsche, Buick, Chevrolet really benefit. We can use the eight, 900 horsepower to reach speeds along here of something over 200 miles per hour. Foot right to the floor as we crest this hill down a very, very dangerous part of the track here. The car is getting very heavy here before we get under hard braking and right here, the most dangerous point in the track, this corner. Very gentle on the gas, up through third and out of fourth gear as we enter the straight once again, Bob. Well, here's a man who knows just how dangerous that turn is. In this morning's pre-race warm-ups, Bob Wallach lost brakes at the Briggs turn and totaled Bruce Levin's Porsche 962. Let's go to Ron. Road Atlanta has claimed yet another car, this time another top contender, the Bridgestone Porsche of Wallach and Barilla, winners this year at Miami. I'm with Bruce Levin, the car owner. Bruce, any indication as to what went wrong? Well, it looks like uh, brake line uh, got severed or we didn't pick it up during the maintenance check and uh, lost his brakes coming down the end of the bowl. How badly damaged? The car's a total wreck. That can become a costly venture. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, the cars are going too fast, and uh, yeah, it's getting very expensive. You're expecting delivery on another car. I'm sure you didn't want it to happen this way. Well, no, I didn't. I wanted to run both cars at Riverside, and it doesn't look like we're going to be able to run two cars, so it, uh, you know, it's just a one-car effort now. But we'll have this one fixed here probably in three weeks, two, three weeks. That's it. Wallach and Barilla out of the competition before the competition ever begins here at Road Atlanta. 
Thank you, Ron. Well, with our field sadly reduced by one, we're about ready to go racing here at Road Atlanta. With 23 cars approaching the grid, we'll be back in a moment to set that grid for today's Atlanta Journal-Constitution Grand Prix here on ESPN. Stay with us. Field takes to this two-and-a-half-mile road course to warm up the tires. Let's see how they'll line up. On the pole, the Corvette prototype driven by South African Cyril Vandermerva and Doc Bundy of Georgia. Outside row one will be 1985 Camel GT champ Al Holbert in a Porsche 962 with his regular co-driver, World Endurance co-champion Derek Bell of England. Inside row two will be the Ford Mustang probe of West German Klaus Ludwig driving with former Trans Am champ Tom Gloy. Starting alongside the Mustang will be the Buick Hawk of John Paul Jr. and co-driver Whitney Gantz of California. Moving to row three, Pete Halsmer in the second Ford Probe. Co-driving with Halsmer will be Lynn St. James, our highest-ranking female driver today. Outside that row will be Sebring winners Bob Aiken and Austrian Joe Gardner in another Porsche. On row four will be the first of the two 12-cylinder Jaguars, driven by Bob Tullius and Chip Robinson. Alongside the Jag will be the BMW prototype of John Watson and his co-driver David Hobbs of England. And as the field continues its warm-up lap, let's take a look at the rest of the field. Darren Brassfield and Jochen Moss will be inside row five. John Winter and Mark Dews outside. In row six, we'll see John Morton and Jim Busby on the inside. Brian Redman and Hurley Haywood in a Jaguar on the outside. Alan Art Leon, owners of this track, will start with Calvin Fish inside row seven. John Collagen and Jim Mullen outside. Bob Earl and Gordon Spice will start the first Camel Light car on row eight with Steve Johnson driving alone outside. Jim Downing and John Mafucci, Brent O'Neill and Steve Shelton make up row nine. Row ten will see Don Bell and Terry Walters on the inside, Mike Brockman and Steve Durst all in Camel Light's cars on the outside. Row eleven will be Mike Gagliardo and Chris Neifel inside, Frank Rubino and Ray Mummery alongside. And rounding out the field, Ruggiero Milgrati and Martino Finotto on row twelve. The pace car is coming down under the bridge turn. We expect to see him come off now as the field forms up behind pole sitter Darrell Vandermerva in the menacing black Corvette prototype. The pace car is off. They'll take turn 12 and on down to the green flag. Let's watch. Whoa, Vandermerva getting a little loose there at the green. And it's a drag race to turn one. Al Holbert outside, Sarah Vandermeer inside, and Holbert takes the lead as they get to turn one, Bill. Looks like the uh, Ford Probe's up there in third, and John Paul's back and forth. are quite surprised to see Sarah sliding that mic, though. Obviously getting a little bit too much power down when the tires really weren't warm enough to give good adhesion. Tremendous power in that Corvette car. Over 900 horsepower from that turbocharged V6. But right now, it's Al Holbert who won nine out of 16 races in that Porsche 962, number 14, last year. Porsches have in fact swept the first three races of 1986, so thus far it looks to be another Porsche parade in IMSA racing. Al Holbert taking turn six, opening up a pretty good sized lead this early in the race as they head into seven. I'm really surprised at this. I spoke with Sarah before the drop of the flag and he had said they wanted to try leading this race and yet Al is putting out an amazing lead really for a first lap of this race. A fairly common problem with these turbocharged cars is plug fouling. Do we suppose they might have had some kind of a problem at the start though? No, I don't think so. I, I think it's more of a probability of uh, just cold tires and Sarah maybe wanted to make sure they're absolutely warm rather than risking damaging the car by a mistake on that first lap. He's closed up here a bit on Al. There's the hardest turn right there. Everybody's got to be so careful coming through there to complete this lap. Single file through 12 and back down to complete the lap. Al Holbert stays out front. Into turn one again. Everyone is closed up. Speeds are phenomenal. One minute and 12 seconds wrong. Whoa, the Ford Probe tried to get inside of Vandem over there at turn two, but couldn't get there. Oh, nope. we have trouble in the front straight. Oh, no. Oh, that's the BMW. It looks like fire. Oh, I can't believe the luck this team is having with fires this year. John Watson in that car trying to get out, struggling to get out of that burning BMW. The fire doesn't appear to be too serious, and here comes help. There's the Group 44 crew down. Looks like Derek Bell is just making sure he's, he's free as Bell well. Derek Bell and Bob Tullius, leader of the Jaguar Group 44 team, out to help out a fellow driver. That's, that's really neat to see. And it looks like the fire won't be any sort of a problem, so let's get back to the action and Al Holbert's way out front. Well, Al is really doing something very uncharacteristic for the Road Atlanta track. And the track itself favors very close competition, and Al is pulling away. He, he's established really a, a very strong lead on only the second lap of the race. Two, three, and four are obviously very close, and the, the Ford Probe looks in very good position at this point, really playing a good game with his excellent handling and very, very strong brakes. So as they come down off of turn 11 into turn 12 to complete lap two here at Road Atlanta, Al Holbert remains your leader in second place. 
the Corvette prototype of Van der Merwe, and in third place, the Ford Probe of Klaus Ludwig. Lots of racing to come. Stay with us. Well, it wasn't my planned program for the day anyway, that's for sure. But just coming down the hill after the bridge, I could smell smoke or something was burning. And turbo engines, you know, normally you think of the turbo, but it seemed to spread and uh, all I did was stop on the pit straight and just try to get out of the car as quickly as possible. We ain't running the rest of the day. Any indication to you on the start that there was going to be a problem? No, I had a good start. I got a clean start um, and there was no problems at all on the opening lap. I was you know, comfortable and just waiting for the, the race to settle down and then try to make some moves, but none of that today. Ron Kendrick with BMW driver John Watson on pit road. Preliminary indications are that a leaky fuel system sprayed on a turbocharger to cause that fire. Bill, that's got to be frustrating for that team. Well, it's not only disappointing for John that his day has been ended so quickly, but it's just incredibly frustrating for the whole crew. These fellows have worked so hard trying to develop this car as quickly as possible. And it's obviously a brilliant race car, but they have been troubled by three fires in a row now. Al Holbert continues to lead, but there's a good shot of the Ford Mustang Pro with Klaus Ludwig in third, followed by John Paul Jr. in the Buick Hawk in fourth place. Bill, you co-drove with John Paul Jr. last year, and, and you know Here. what this car can do, but... we got a pass coming oh, up, Bob. John Paul Jr. just blows by Klaus Ludwig in the Ford, and I guess that leads to what I was going to ask you, Bill. You drove that car last year, but you were unable to finish a race, so you know what it's like to get a, one of these sophisticated cars ready to race. Well, that was part of the problem last year. We had incredible horsepower, like what you just saw there. Unbelievable, 900 plus of reliable horsepower, but the chassis simply couldn't stand up to it, and our, our finishing record was absolutely dreadful. Al Holbert leads. The Corvette you see there at the right of your screen is in second place. John Paul Jr. now in third place, and moving up fast on Cyril Van der Merwe. The Ford Probe now drops into fourth place with two-time Le Mans winner Klaus Ludwig at the wheel, as we said. Once again, around through turn two and into the S's. John is really closing up noticeably on Serral, too. It looks like he may have the bit between his teeth. And historically, he has always done well at this track. He's a driver of tremendous, absolutely outstanding talent. And I think he wants to do well in front of a lot of his friends right here today. Originally from Lawrenceville, Georgia, 26 years old, now living in West Palm Beach, Florida, John Paul Jr. closing up on Van Merva and the Corvette. That, that's a bit of a shock for the, the uh, Buick Hawk to be closing up under their braking on that Corvette because the Corvette really does have an outstandingly stable chassis and braking is one of its very strong points. The Buick Hawk, by comparison, has always been a bit of an unstable car and it's really difficult to uh, outbrake anybody. A little bit further back in the pack here, this is John Collagian in a Porsche Mars chassis battling with the 67 BFG Porsche carrying our in-car camera here on ESPN as they battle for eighth place. There's the Yost Racing Porsche, a European imported 962. The Yost Racing Team, winners of the Le Mans race with Klaus Ludwig at the wheel, trying their first season of IMSA racing here in the United States. That's maybe a very good idea of just what the Camel GT Series is coming to, where you're getting a, a team of Le Mans winning caliber over here competing with the best of the North Americans. And we really are getting a tremendous international flavor. Probably mechanically as well as internationally the most diverse road racing series in the world. There is Al Holbert already lapping the back of this field. That's a Camel Lights car, a lightweight prototype with a Mazda engine, a little bit downside from these big prototype cars with seven, eight, nine hundred horsepower engines. That's Frank Marino and Ray Mummery in the Camel Lights class just getting past at will by the big prototype. It looks like John is continuing to close up on Sarah Hill. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he'd take a shot at passing here, but the interesting to watch just the comparison and acceleration between these two turbocharged American motors. Both of these cars using turbocharged V6 engines out of Detroit and capable of well over 900 horsepower, which John Paul Jr. is using right now to pass Cyril Van der Merwe. Well, possibly John's got the boost knob screwed up just that extra little bit, maybe running a, a higher horsepower number for the opening part of the race. But I'm quite surprised that Cyril is content to drop back to third like that. He's a real fighter and really likes to charge to start the race. Turbo control setting, something we'll have to talk about as this race goes on, but obviously John Paul Jr. has all the horsepower he needs as he blows by Cyril Van der Merwe and opens up a big lead, setting his sights now on our leader, Al Holbert. You've got to wonder if there might be some kind of a problem with that pole-sitting car. Ron Kendrick is patrolling pit road and thinks he may have the answer. Let's go down to Ron Kendrick now. The indication from the Cyril Van der Merwe pit is that the car may be having tire problems. Van der Merwe indicates that he's not happy with the tires that are on the car, and he may be pitting shortly. Thank you, Ron. Well, it may be tire problems. Just seven laps into this 124-lap event. Good shot there as he heads into turn one. John Paul Jr. out of West Palm Beach, Florida, 
a little bit of tire smoke over that bump in turn one. Yeah, I think what that is, uh, the Buick engine historically has always given out just that little bit of oil. It's not really a problem, but it's somewhat misleading to the spectators. Oil smoke and not tire smoke is what you're telling me, Bill. Well, anyway, John Paul Jr. is just having his way as he starts to move up on our leader, Al Holbert. Well, John's driving beautifully at this point. You can, you can watch him. He gets right to the edge of the track under braking, goes through the corner, cuts right to the very inside, and then the car is sliding right up to the outside once again. Paul Jr. lying second. Al Holbert, our leader, will be back at Road Atlanta in just a moment. This IMSA Camel Grand Prix race for prototype sports cars, and there's your leader, Al Holbert, out of Warrington, Pennsylvania, the 1985 Camel GT Series champion, pressed hard at this point by John Paul Jr. We could see a battle for the lead here. Yeah, I'm sitting here smiling for John. Uh, he's like so many really hard competitors. He gets terribly frustrated when the car doesn't work properly. But today, the Buick March, or the Buick Hawk, is set up perfectly, and he's obviously having a really good time. I know what he's feeling at this point. It, it's very exciting to be closing on the Camel GT champion, Al Holbert. And John knows that he's going to take a run at him in a few minutes. Right now, he's just trying to figure exactly where he wants to do it. John also might be learning some things about that car with three hours or so of racing to do. Actually, one of the shorter events on the series this year. The car probably changes a good bit over the length of the race, I would imagine. It really does. You've got a number of variables to worry about. Oh, are we going to get a pass here? Oh, John Paul Jr. challenging Al right Holbert on the outside. Side. He's got him, too. Goes right on by Al Holbert. John Paul Jr. just blowing through the field. He started fourth. He is now on the lead, 10 laps into this 124-lap race. A beautiful pass. That is a particularly difficult part to pass on. It, it really doesn't show to the viewers, but you're traveling over 200 miles an hour coming over the crest of a hill. And it looks to be relatively straightforward and simple. It most definitely is not. It's very scary, and John did it beautifully. Well, credit Frank Rubino in that lapped car for getting out of the way as well. The drivers are warned in the Camel Lights class that these prototypes are going to come flying up from behind. As you mentioned, Bill, it's a very difficult track to pass on so that the, uh, the other drivers have to cooperate with the leaders coming by. The driver courtesy is extremely important here on a track that, that's so twisty and, and it's got so many elevation changes. You've got an additional problem that just looking in your mirrors, you really sometimes can't see all that you want to see. Here's the way they stand. John Paul Jr. in the Buick Hawk out front. Al Holbert following in a Porsche 962. Sarah Vandermerva in the pole-sitting Corvette prototype, now shown third. We've had a change in fourth. There you see Pete Halsmer in the 07 Ford Probe, followed by Klaus Ludwig in the number seven car. That's the sister car for that team. And probably one of the most interesting cars on this mechanically diverse IMSA series are the Ford Probes, Bill. State-of-the-art machinery. Uh, no question about it. They are amazing cars. And we made no secret about it that last year, we would have given our souls to have one of these chassis with the turbocharged Buick motor in it. We had so much horsepower, we didn't have the sophistication. Look at, now here's an interesting shot for the viewers to watch. Those are absolutely identical cars, and yet because Klaus got a little bit better run onto the straight, he's able to get his foot out of the floor that much earlier, he got that additional surge and was able to pass the heat and now bump into fourth place. Two-liter turbocharged four-cylinder engines in these cars, as opposed to the three-and-a-half-liter turbocharged V6 of the big Buick out front. Klaus Ludwig now lying in fourth place, ahead of Pete Halsberg in two sister cars. Very light, very maneuverable. Ford Probes eventually destined to be customer cars, and we'll see more of them on the Camel Grand Prix series. It's really amazing that, that you take a car like this with 200 horsepower less than what the Corvette or what the Buick puts out, and yet they're able to remain competitive just by superior handling, superior braking, and of course the aerodynamics. It, it, they're visibly very, very smooth cars. Only the second year on the IMSA Camel Grand Prix series for these Ford Probes. Klaus Ludwig moving up on a lapper now. Pete Halsmer following in fifth place. Klaus is such a beautiful driver to watch. He put on a display last year at Columbus, Ohio. It was just outstanding. We took a walk through the paddock to talk with lead driver Klaus Ludwig and Ford crew chief Ian Dawson about these spectacular cars. Let's take a look at what's inside the probe. The probe is... It's very, very good in fast turns. Uh, it has a lot of ground effects. And uh, I think if we would have some more torque, we would be really a second faster everywhere, and that would bring us to the pole. But still, I'm happy because we are always under the first five, and uh, it's not so bad. The car for sure is very, very stiff. 
you feel the slightest changes, if you change a little bit spring rate or if you change a little bit of the roll bar, you feel it immediately. It's critical in the right height. Uh, but I think chassis-wise and bodywork-wise, we are the best car in the field, for sure. Yes, yeah, we're really pleased. It's obviously a totally different direction that the company went in the first place with a space frame car. Uh, it didn't really do the job with the movement of technology and uh, Ford made the commitment to go with this type of construction which is made of a series of modular boxes, uh, five of them total that are bolted together and together can form a, a chassis. It's extremely strong, very light and we find very easy and maintenance wise, serviceability is good. This car has no metal at all, it's all made of composite materials, everything from the body to the main chassis. It's been a very careful work process to get the car to be reliable and successful and I think we're making some very good headway now and the car can compete against the stronghold the Porsches have had over the last few years. Well, as he said, this really is the wave of the future. It's the, uh, the technique, the materials they're using, it is the car of the future. No victories yet for the Ford probes, but a second and a fifth in 1985, still under development. John Paul Jr. continues to lead. We'll be back with more IMSA Racing after this. The schedule is the most extensive in television history, featuring 84 races from 11 different circuits, including live or same-day flag-to-flag coverage of 51 events. We're at Road Atlanta today. Bob Barsha, Bill Adam, and Ron Kendrick with you for 500 miles of Issa Camel GT racing. And Bill, we got a pass coming up here. Well, there's a perfect example of what 900 horsepower looks like when you're following. Now, our camera car, a Porsche 962, has about 750 horsepower, which can really get staggering acceleration. And yet, look at the way this Buick Hawk is pulling away. That's the most frustrating thing. There's nothing you can do. It last year, I was fortunate to be in the car. It was able to pull away, albeit for usually very brief periods. Now, we mentioned earlier, turbo boost control may be a factor in, in dialing the kind of horsepower that John Paul Jr. has obviously got here. Definitely. But this year, for the first time in IMSA, the turbo boost knobs that were normally at the driver's elbow are now out of his reach in the back of the car. Anytime they want to adjust the turbo boost, they have to stop and let the crew do it. By the same token, the Porsches this year are also carrying 160 pounds of extra weight. That's by virtue of Porsches having won 15 of 16 events in 1985 and the first three events here in 1986. But it hasn't been easy. There you see Al Holbert, whose team won the 24 Hours of Daytona. They've had to overcome a series of brake problems this year, and we asked them if it was due to the new rules. Well, I think it is. There's no doubt about it that we're using a, we're using them a lot harder than we ever had to. That, that's one of the strong suits of the Porsche. And, you know, believe it or not, straightaway speed and power is not the strong suit of a Porsche. It's, it's the braking and getting into the corner. And, uh, you know, that extra weight has certainly uh, aggravated that problem. Well, I suppose it's a problem that a lot of Al Holbert and the other Porsche drivers' competitors wouldn't be too sympathetic with, Bill. Uh, definitely. I think the, uh, the power has played a very significant part in the Porsche domination, but the reliability of the cars have been absolutely amazing. Plus the fact that you've got so many of them out there. Uh, last year, of course, we only had a single Buick Hawk to work with. There are only two Jaguars, and yet you've got endless numbers of these 962s. Two or three can break down. You've still got some there that can come through with the win because they're all brilliant cars. There is our leader, the Buick Hawk of John Paul Jr. We got a, a close look at Al Holbert a moment ago and a glimpse of the uh, 962 of Bob Aiken's team, the Sebring winners, with a little body damage up front. They obviously took it off. Oh. The We've got a spin. That's John Collation's Porsche March, and he has spun in a bad spot, Bill. That's a very dangerous point. This is just coming down the hill from that dangerous bridge turn that we spoke of. The cars are cresting this under full throttle acceleration, coming down the hill well over 100 miles an hour. John appears to be stuck there, and the potential of a very serious accident is quite real at this point. That's John Collagen's Porsche March, stuck at the entrance to Pitt Road. We'll probably have a full course caution as a result of that accident. The car is in a, a dangerous position, as they say, and they'll slow everybody down as a result of it. But it could be a blessing for these cars. They've been running at a record pace to this point with 33 laps in. And here's the first of our pit stops. That's the brand new Pontiac Fiero. It's a Camel Lights car running in the a lightweight prototype division. This is its debut race. Bob Earl put that car in the pole in its debut. And he is running in first place in that class right now. That's a very, very impressive little car. It was built by Spice Engineered from England, which, of course, were world endurance champions last year. And it looks like the pace car is going out. So they do have a problem with that car being stuck on top. 
horsepower. Here comes Ben de Merva in the Corvette. Now, we pointed out earlier that there may be tire problems with this car. This will be an opportunity for them to get all of the little bugs worked out and get ready to go the distance. 33 laps in, Van de Merva will pit. We'll see the air hose attached to the side of the car. The car will rise up on its onboard jacks. You see Van de Merva getting out there. Ready for his co-driver. I don't see Bundy coming out. Vandermeer has his hands up. Here he comes. Bet surprise there that uh, Doc wasn't quite ready to get in the car. And he's going to be lucky that there is a pace car out. If this is a full green course condition when that had happened, uh, I think they'd have some words to say. Pit strategy is so important in these endurance races, despite their length. Seems like a pretty good stop, to, nevertheless. It, it has gone smoothly. They're rolling away the old tires there, and uh, they can take their time a little bit because we do have this pace car incident. Incidentally, this, this is a perfect time to make your pit stop because like stock car racing, you really don't lose very much time. You're able to rejoin the pack at the end, and it, it's not a critical time to be as fast as possible. Take a little extra care and caution to make sure the car is absolutely perfect. And so we continue under full course caution. We've seen a pit stop by one of our leaders, the car you see right there, the number 52 Corvette of Cyril van der Merwe, now being driven by Doc Bundy. We expect to see more pit stops. That'll shuffle the order. But right now, our leader is John Paul Jr. We'll be back with more racing right at car. A tachometer really does nothing more than take up space on the dashboard or look pretty. In a racing car, these are vital pieces of equipment, giving very important information. This is a little extra. The additional red line in the face of the tachometer actually follows underneath the flight as it goes around the scale and stays at the highest engine RPM. What this can do is to enable both the driver and the crew chief to give proper gearing to the car for different road circuits and in some cases tell if the driver has abused the engine by revving it too high. We're still under caution here at Road Atlanta. Ron Kendrick is standing by down in pit road with Cyril Vandermerva. How is this Corvette handling under race conditions here at Road Atlanta? It's handling okay. The track isn't that good at the moment. It's very slippery. There's a lot of oil and rubber on it. So uh, the cars tend to be a bit twitchy, but I think that everybody's got the same problem. You've had enough pole positions this year. It'd be nice to get a win, wouldn't it? It sure is all good. As the pace car comes around one more time, you see the crews working on John Collagen's spun-out car, and here comes our leader, John Paul Jr., to pit. Well, you know that the surprising thing for me at this point, Bob, is the fact that Al Holbert is not coming in. He is staying on the track, and I really don't understand his psychology in staying out. Uh, Al is obviously a proven master at this game, having won the Camel GT Championship last year. And seeming like an endless stream of victories, but to keep his car on the track at this point, I don't know. I, I'm really mystified by this action. You see John Paul Jr. getting out of the Buick Hawk. Whitney Gans will get in. Now, Whitney Gans was supposed to drive a sister car to this Buick Hawk, but the engine blew on that car in this morning's practice. So Gans has well, replaced Bob Lobenberg in John Paul Jr.'s John car. Paul the two most experienced drivers with the Buick Hawk will handle the car in the race. That's, too, that, that's another interesting point, that last year we ran uh, the entire entire season of uh, 17 races with no engine problems at all. The, the Buick, even with its incredible horsepower, was absolutely, totally reliable. And yet this year, they've had a number of engine problems, which may show the level of competition in the Camel GT series. It's just becoming hotter and hotter, and I think they've got to turn the boost up a little higher to remain in that front. You saw, Al, you saw actually John Paul Jr. there wave his arms as though in dismay. I can't believe he's upset with the performance of that car thus far. They seem to be driving just fine. Ahead of the 45 cars that takes the track is the 04 Jaguar. That's the Brian Redmond Hurley Haywood car that won this race a year ago. Yeah, I think really, uh, to be quite honest, that the Jaguar win last year was something of luck and that all of the major competitors either broke down or were involved in, in incidents on the track, uh, such as what happened to Al Holbert a year ago. He was knocked off the track by a, a stray car. And the Jaguars, through their wonderful reliability and uh, obviously superior fuel economy, were able to come through for a one-two finish, which is a, a great tribute to Group 44 and, and to the crew chief and their, their entire organization. Al Holbert led much of this race last year before, as you mentioned, Bill, getting knocked off the track by a slower car. Last year, these big prototypes and Camel Lights prototypes ran with the GTO and GTU cars in IMSA Racing. Those are the production-based cars. As we watch the other Jaguar, the 44 car of Bob Tullius,
Williams coming on pit road. We expect Chip Robinson, who you see in the background there, to step into that car. But Holbert was knocked off by a GTO car because of the traffic problems, obviously. IMSA officials decided to run only the prototypes together this year. I think it's it's really it's a smart move. The, the GTO cars are putting on a, a spectacular race in their own right, and I think it's good for them to have their own event. They, they are putting out some tremendous racing, and there's tremendous factory participation in the GTO ranks nowadays, so it's not only safer from a prototype standpoint, but it, it's also better from the IMSA standpoint that the fans can get to see double the good racing. There's the Group 44 crew just working away there. They really are just one of the top crews in the Camel GT Series, and I think they're admired by everyone. I need to correct myself there. I said Tullius was bringing that in. It was Chip Robinson getting out of that car. Car owner Bob Tullius is now in. The 12-cylinder, normally aspirated, V12 Jaguar taking its place as the field continues under yellow here. We expect to see the green flag very shortly. The collagen wreck has been picked up, and yet our leader remains, Al Holbert, who has not yet pitted. Could be a here. We'll be back in a moment to see how it works itself out. Flag conditions here at Road Atlanta. 40 laps into the Atlanta Journal and Constitution Grand Prix. Here you see the battle for fourth place between Lynn St. James and the Ford Probe and Whitney Gans, who has taken over for John Paul Jr. in the Buick Hawk. And once again, an example of what big horsepower will do for you, Bill. Uh, Whitney just loves this situation. An advantage that horsepower gives you is, is something that, that's so important, and that is safe passing. Now, Whitney can pull out on the straight there, where it's just simply acceleration, get by Lynn, and there really is no risk of contact that point. It, it's a perfectly safe pass. Now he's free of, of the uh, probe and he can make a shot at hopefully a third place car. Watch the suspension work as that car bobs its way down the bumpy front straight here at Road Atlanta. Gantz, 31 years old out of Laguna de Gale, California. Just coming up to pass the track owner. Whoa, Wendy, don't Ooh. do that. Gantz gets the door slammed on him there. That's the number two car of track owners Alan Art Leon and Calvin Fish. I believe one of the Leon brothers driving that car right now. He's almost got a chance to see the Road Atlanta countryside a little bit closer. Good way to lose some of that adrenaline early on. And there you see the car of Al Holbert, who has yet to pit. We are back under green flag conditions. Al Holbert missed the opportunity to pit while the entire field was slowed by the yellow flag. And, Bill, that may be a big gamble for the Holbert team. I, I've got to believe there's a, a problem here in communication between Al and Tom Siebel, the crew chief, because now to make his pit stop, no matter how fast it is, is still going to lose something between 30 and 40 seconds, including his on and off track time. That's slowing down to getting back at the racing speed. Whereas if he had made the stop under the yellow flag situation, he would just be at the back of this pack and would probably only be oh, 15 seconds back. This has to be a, a very bad point for him. Over hoping for another yellow flag. Meanwhile, this is Tom Gloy, the 1984 Trans Am champion, a sedan driver, now driving the Ford Mustang Pro, but Actually, that, that doesn't do justice to Gloy, who has driven open-wheel cars and formula cars in the past. He's one of the, one of the fine American all-around drivers. Tom is an immensely experienced driver and, and a very, very smart driver as well, which I, I think was paramount to uh, his choice by the Ford organization. He has never been a car wrecker. He always brings cars home. And, and it, it's so important to endurance racing that you do have somebody drive with the intelligence as well as just the raw ability to go fast. Lynn St. James in the number two Ford Probe, the 07 car, being paced at this point by Bob Tullius in the 12-cylinder, normally aspirated Jaguar. Turbocharged car, two-liter engine versus non-turbocharged car. No, I was with the uh, Group 44 organization for four years, and uh, I still have a soft spot in my heart for that car. I, I love listening to it. The V12 sound is so pretty. And this is, of course, will remind you where the Jaguars won a year ago. In fact, they took one, two. Obviously, Bob Julius at this point having very little trouble keeping up with the small, lightweight, turbocharged Ford Probe. But the days, I think we can say, Bill, are, are probably numbered for non-turbocharged cars in IMSA racing. It really appears so. Uh, I think in the, the initial stages that a, a turbocharged car's advantages were offset a little bit by the reliability of it and possibly the fuel mileage. But now with the electronic uh, management systems they have on these motors, their mileage is getting better and better. And you just simply can't compete with the 900 to 1,000 horsepower that a good turbocharged Buick or Chevrolet puts out with the approximately 700 horsepower that the V12 Jag puts out. I asked Chip Robinson of the Jaguar team before the race whether the, the torque band of the Jaguar that was supposed to be the one of the uh, one of the mitigating factors against the turbo cars really helped them. He said, yeah, for about five feet. And yet here goes Bob Tullius passing the turbo car of Lynn St. James. 
That's one thing. I think maybe maybe Chip was uh, being a little bit helpful uh, to his competitors because really the torque of the Jag is a very important part, particularly on a tight track. Bob Julius, who campaigned SCCA cars for quite some time, a Trans Am competitor where you knew it, Bill. Yeah, my original races, uh, where I first met Bob, was in the Trans Am series. I was running a, an old Corvette against the, uh, his XJS Jaguar. And was always impressed with the organization back then. Bob Julius driving. Chip Robinson is out of the car, and Ron Kendrick is down on pit road with Chip. Let's go to Ron now. Chip, everything seems to be coming together. Yeah, everything is running beautifully. The car is handling great while I was in it, and uh, it's going very, very smoothly. No problems at all. How difficult is it going to be to climb that car into first place? Well, that's going to be uh, a little tough, I think. That Chevrolet really looks like it's running well, so we'll just have to wait and see and hope they have a little bit of problem. Words from Chip Robinson of the Jaguar team as we watch Tom Gloy bring the Mustang Pro back into action off pit road. He shouldn't have stopped this early after a driver change, and I wonder if everything's going well for the Ford team right now. There's a good shot. Tom Gloy, former Trans Am champ, driving this Ford Mustang Probe into the top five here at Road Atlanta. You know, what a great-looking car this is. It? it seems there are so many good... Oh, we have an off-course excursion here. This is the, let's see, the number 80 car. That's the red Ferrari Alba. Martino Fanato and Ruggiero Melgrati in the Camel Lights class, the lightweight prototype cars, and he seems to be having a problem with that thing. Yeah, it looked like the bodywork there has come a little bit loose as well. There, there's some tape hanging off the side there that possibly they had to put something on during their pit stop, and uh, maybe not it's all quite right that far. Now, as they crest the hill, you get an idea of what it's like for these drivers traveling at high speed. If there's an obstruction, a car in a bad spot on the track, you really get no look at it before you're virtually on top of it. No, it, it's so important here, and I think the flagmen, as you can see right there in the picture, they're so important to the drivers. They're able to tell you exactly what is in front of you. And even though you're entering a corner at 150, 160 miles an hour and can't see over the crest of the hill, by watching the flagman, you're able to ascertain whether or not the track is clear. Doc Bundy making his way down the backstretch, presently shown in second place in the Corvette prototype behind Al Holbert in the Porsche. And here's our leader, Holbert, on pit road. Derek Bell making his way to the driver's side door. Now, Bill, this is exactly what they had hoped would not happen, having to pit under green. Well, this, this is terrible, where they could have had a very leisurely stop with the yellow car, with the pace car situation. Now they have to rush. And in fact, it appears they're, they're maybe having a little bit of a problem is still stuck in that doorway try to adjust the belts for Derek he and Derek are slightly different size and you have to make quick adjustments to those seat belts they're definitely having a problem there's, there's no question usually Al has completed his job at this point and the door is down you saw the, the crew waving there pointing their fingers down they're ready for the car to get back out and yet the driver switch hasn't been made 40 seconds in the pits for Holbert and Bell that's not what they wanted at this point there is your new leader the Corvette prototype the pole sitting car with Doc Bundy at the wheel has taken over the lead now shown in second place, John Paul Jr. and Whitney Gantz in the Buick and Hawk. We'll be back with more racing right after racing. And there you see our leaders, Doc Bundy in the Corvette prototype. And but the leader is coming on to pit road, Bill. Yeah, that's just a bit of a surprise. I hope it's going to be a normal stop for them. This car has been so strong in all of the races it's competed in, and yet has gone through the, the usual little teething problems that new race cars have to go through. Only in its fourth race, the Corvette prototype has taken the pole in every IMSA Camel Grand Prix race in which it has appeared. A pretty remarkable record, and that gives you some idea of the potential this car has. Doc Bundy is getting out. Cyril Vandermerga will be getting in for what we assume will be the last driver's stint. A full load of fuel should take them most of the rest of the way. I think one of the real important things about this, this particular record that they have been in the pole every race is they've had wide diversifications in track. They've been on the pole at Daytona where pure horsepower is such a strong advantage and yet Farrell again sat in the pole in Miami. A very, very tight street track. There you see Whitney Gans who has taken over the lead while the Corvette pits. Doc Bundy is out of the Corvette. Zaro Vandermerva is back in. Doc Bundy is now with Ron Kendrick down on pit road. Let's go to Ron now. Doc Bundy has just taken his turn in the race-leading Chevrolet Corvette. Doc, I guess it was nice just to get in the car, let alone get in the lead car. Yeah, it was great. Finally, I got my turn. The car's running really well. The car's running very good. We're having to baby it. It's running a little bit hot, and the track is very slippery. So it's, it's kind of a, a 
aggressiveness, but with a little bit of conservativeness in it to make the car make it. Got a little bit of a lead, so you can feather it just a little bit, but not too much. No, you still have to keep at it pretty good. Uh, you get some traffic brakes, and then other guys don't give you any brakes, so you have to make some, and then be, it's, 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 there's a lot of close calls. I about bought the farm about three laps before I come in. Doc Bundy referring there to an incident three laps ago in which he was attempting to overtake Derek Bell in Al Holbrook's number 14 Porsche. So that gives you some idea of where the third place car is right now. A long pit stop drops Derek Bell and Al Holbrook to a distant third. They have been now put a lap down by the Corvette GTP car running in second. The Buick Hawk with Whitney Gantz behind the wheel is up front. Right now you're looking at the Ford Probe with Tom Gloy behind the wheel making its way down through the bowl as the drivers call it up to the bridge turn at turn 11. Straight away. Tom Gloy spending his first year in his Camel GT effort with the Ford Mustang Probe. Before today's race here at Road Atlanta, I had the opportunity to talk with Tom Gloy and I asked him a little bit about the challenges of running here at Road Atlanta. Is there any particular part of this course that either gives you most trouble or you think a, a driver that's not familiar with the course needs to be most concerned about? Can this course get up and bite you anywhere? Well, it can sure bite you, there's no doubt about it. On the back straightaway, at the tail end of that straightaway, you're heading downhill flat, flat out absolutely as fast as, uh, as the car will go at that point, fastest point on the circuit. Go down into a real severe dip and just start up the other side and, and, and trying to slow the car down from the top of fifth gear into the middle of third gear and, and uh, negotiate going underneath the bridge. If there's a place on this circuit where the course can bite you really hard, that's it. Tom Gloy talking about this 2.5-mile road Atlanta circuit undergoing extensive renovation at the hands of new owners Al and Art Leon. They're going to add new track surfacing, extra spectator areas. They're even going to add condominiums down the backstretch here. And, Bill Adam, I know you've bought yours already. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I bought one for you too, Bob. I, I thought that you'd perhaps like one. We can both sit on our balconies and do the reporting from there. Absolutely. I wouldn't miss it. Tom Gloy with the Ford Mustang Pro presently showing in fourth position. We make our way through the Atlanta Journal-Constitution Grand Prix. There is the number 44 Jaguar. Chip Robinson back behind the wheel, having taken over for Bob Tullius. Whoa! Almost coming together there with the Corvette close. GTP car. You know, it was very interesting. One of the comments that Chip made a little bit earlier during his interview was the fact that they were hoping for breakage on other cars before they could think of a win. And I think this maybe really brings to light the whole psychology or philosophy behind the Jaguar team right now. They really feel they are not competitive unless they can have breakage or troubles by another team. They just can't go and race flat out with these other cars and hope for a, uh, an absolute victory. There is your leader, the number 45 Buick Hawk of Whitney Gantz out of the Los Angeles, California area. Now coming on to pit road. Well, we expect this would be the last pit stop. We'll see a driver change. John Paul Jr. getting back into the car. Whitney Gantz getting out. We'll see tires and fuel. And at this point, we see John Paul Jr. waving there, welcoming Whitney Gantz back. At this point, we expect the last pit stop. Pit stops would be very important at this point. And in fact, trading the lead under green could be very dangerous for whichever team is out front. Here comes the Corvette taking over first place. You know, I would wonder at this point, too, if now, uh, with it being probably their last stop, if the crew chief on the, uh, the Buick Hawk might not just turn up that boost a little bit and give them the extra horsepower to let John make his last charge for the lead and hopefully the win. Cyril Van der Verba waking his way around in the Corvette. Following a slower car, that's the number 80 car of Melgradi and Pinotto, a camel lights machine. Doc should have, excuse me, Sarah should have no problem getting by. And he does a nice move there. Just the uh, number 80 car did pull wide just to allow Sarah to go by with uh, a minimum of risk on his car. Very polite. Move. Sarah Vandemerva, originally born in South Africa, now living in Indianapolis, Indiana. And here comes John Paul Jr. off of pit road. As you can see, he's got almost a half a lap down now to the leading Corvette. And John Paul Jr., you can bet, is going to be trying to make time. Well, to, to be in a position like this, if I had uh, to take the role of a team leader and get my choice of driver to try and make up that much time, I certainly could not ask for anybody better than John. He has so much experience on this track and just his, his raw natural ability. Makes him one of the, the fastest drivers in the entire Camel GT series. He's, he's brilliant. And, when you give John a challenge like this, he's really at his best. This is really a critical juncture in this race. We now have American-powered cars running one and two. There's our leading Corvette. No, 
Oh, I really like to hear the sound of that. American engine cars running one and two. Uh, in the past, they've always been very, very strong qualifying and usually good challengers for the opening part of the race. But now here we have a tremendous spot. There are your leaders. We'll be back at Road Atlanta right after this. Your Camel Lights leader, John Mafucci, driving the Mazda-powered Argo, leading in the division for lightweight prototype cars, being overtaken by Derek Bell. And whoa! Giving Derek Bell a very narrow moment there. John Mafucci giving up no ground at all. Almost had a little paint swap there. Derek is running very, very hard right now. And it's, it's a little bit frustrating for him. He has 800 horsepower to play with. The, uh, the smaller, the GTP light cars have maybe half or a little bit more. And, and they have as much right to road race. Here's a perfect example right here. Derek wants to get past, but actually has to lift off the gas and let the littler, the, the smaller car, there's a good word for you, littler, let the smaller car pass a slower one. Here's your leader, Saral Vandermerva in the Corvette. Bell presently running second, and Vandermerva swinging wide through turn 11, down through turn 12. He's not getting off at all either. No, he's, he's running very hard right now, and Vandermeer. it looks like we've got a, a tremendous situation developing with Saral being in the car at this point. This is the driver that has set the pole position at each of the four events that this car has contested. We've got Derek in the 962 Porsche. Derek is immensely experienced in this car. He runs the 962s in North America, runs the 956. Look at this, like right over to the edge of the pavement, really using up all the track, just getting his foot right into it. As I say, tremendously experienced in this type of car, and I believe we've got John Paul Jr. in this car here. We have the three fastest drivers in their own respective cars, all setting down for the final little go. See who is going to win this race. Paul Jr. running in third place in the Buick. Bell is in second. Sal van der Merwe leads. And we should point out, neither the Corvette nor the Buick Hawk in... Well, what, 12 appearances for the Buick last year, three appearances thus far this year, no finishes yet. So uh, we go, here's the Ford Pro. One moment we've got problems with that car, apparently. Tom Gloy moving very slowly on the pit road, and you can hear the, the misfiring of that engine. A very rough engine in the Ford Pro. This could be a problem. It sounds like they've got some sort of ignition problem, uh, whether it's just one of the transistors has gone off or... or Possibly even the timing is flipping. It's almost a backfire, a crackling situation. Presently shown in fifth position, this is Tom Gloy, Klaus Ludwig, you see in the blue and white helmet, will be getting into the car. They don't appear to be looking under the hood, though, so apparently it's it's not something they feel like they can deal with right now, if, in fact, they're even aware of it. That's, uh, that's a, a bit mysterious right now that uh, they're not doing something. I know they do have a great number of the electrical components inside the driving cockpit, but the passenger door hasn't been put up, so no one's going to be uh, doing anything about that. Maybe they just out. Yeah. Casey Gloy in the red suit, showing a little frustration there as he turns away from his car. Last look with his in, and here they go. No, you, you can hear a crackling right You, you can hear it. They're, they're making popcorn that car. So problems in the Ford pit. As you were calling it, that is a going down pit lane, you can still hear that car, it's just it's not running properly. I'm surprised they didn't try to uh, fix that problem. They should have radio contact. All of these cars do have very sophisticated two-way radios inside. And while we're driving, we can talk to the crew chief. Klaus Ludwig obviously having a problem with that car. Let's go down to Ron Kendrick on pit road, who was in the Ford pit. Ron? This trip to Road Atlanta for the Ford Probe team has not really been all that good. Both of the cars broke an ignition coil. They were replaced on both cars. Right now, they seem okay. Well, obviously, they're not okay. Beg your pardon, Ron, but Klaus Ludwig, you see, wrestling with that car. He has definitely got an engine problem in the Ford Probe. Oh, uh, this, this has to be so frustrating for Klaus. That this would have put him into a great situation, too. Look at this. Derek's continuing to slide that car around. Now, he is having fun with this car. He's using a lot of horsepower and really having a chance to, to have a go at it. Usually, in an endurance race, you have to drive at a reduced pace, and you can't afford to, to play with the car. What Derek has now is an opportunity, because he is behind, use all the horsepower he's got, and really drive to the limit of his ability. Now, as you saw Derek Bell make that turn through turn seven and onto the long back straight, the Buick Hawk with John Paul Jr. at the controls was following him. Very short gap, and here oh. comes Bell on the pit road. This is your second place car. Derek Bell will hand off the assume to Al Holbert. He'll take a full load of fuel, and Al Holbert will drive the wheels off this car all the way to the finish. There's the door open, and Bell wants to make sure they don't spend anywhere near as much time in the this time as they did the first time around. Oh, I hope not. Here I... 
I still have to believe that, that the initial stop not being made under yellow is going to come back and haunt them. Just look at the lead that John's able to pull out now as we saw the low and draw car go into the pits. John Paul Jr. now running in second behind the Corvette. And by our figures, the fastest car on the track right now is that Holbert Bell car. So as you were saying, Bill, if not for that long pit stop, they would really be up in the thick of it in this race. They've had virtually no mechanical problems. They're running very, very quickly, but they just spent too much time getting Bell into the car. Well, John's continued to drive a very strong race, too. You, you can see him, again, going right to the edge of the pavement, under braking, and then turning into the apex of the corner, having the car slide right out again to that edge. He's using up all the track as well and driving very, very hard. Roughly 30 seconds down. The question now, who has enough gas to go the whole way? Daryl Vandermerva making his way around. This is John Paul Jr. presently running in second place. Derek Bell is out of the car. Al Holbert is back in the low and brow Porsche. Ron Kendrick is down on pit road with Derek Bell. As you watch Al Holbert making his way around, let's go to Ron and Derek. driving chores of the low and brow Porsche 962 to Al Holbert for the time being. Derek, it seems to be just little minor problems that are plaguing the car, not major mechanical. Oh, no, the car's going fine. I mean, there's no reason that we're not, that we couldn't go any faster. It's only the fuel light wasn't working, which doesn't matter at all. <laughs> you just wait, you wait till you just stop running and then you switch on to reserve. And the car was going really well. It's just that the tires were, sli were sliding all over the place. Can't blame the tires. It's just very greasy, you know. There's a lot of rubber, a heck of a lot of rubber. There's been a lot of racing this weekend. And uh, I got I seem to get held up in traffic more than my share, I thought. <laughs> but I guess everybody did. But I just seem to pack somebody every time up at turn two and I had to follow them right down to seven. What do you think the chances are now getting the car back into first place? Well, there's still a few laps to go, so you can't discount anything at this time. I never believe anything until the checkered flag goes out, so who knows? We'll have to see. He's a very fine driver, but I don't think it's up to him. I think it's up to the others. They've got another fuel stop to make, whereas we haven't. Well, there may be a clue to our situation. According to Derek Bell and the Porsche pits, there are fuel stops expected for the leading Corvette and the number two Buick Hawk. But this is Al Holbert making his way around this road Atlanta circuit as fast as he dares. Well, I want... I wonder if this might be another one of these patented finishes here that Al and Derek seem so often to be out of contention, yet they always come to the full out win. What it may turn out to be is just a tremendous three-car battle, because if you're leading two cars, the uh, Buick Hawk and the Corvette, you have to make stops. Potentially, you've got a situation of getting out with all cars together. Not the kind of situation we're used to in endurance racing, where events are won by laps rather than mere seconds. But here's our leader, Cyril Vandenberga, overtaking our in-car camera, the number 67 BMG Porsche. Let's go inside, see how it looks. There's a good move right there, just a simple braking move up the inside as we go through this tight right-hand corner, down to second gear. Here's the corner, auto straight, you can see what 900 horsepower looks like from a 750 horsepower. Second gear, third, fourth, fifth, and look at that Corvette stretch to lead. We got a shootout on our hands, and we'll be back right after this. There's heart in this land, it's there and all we do. That's where our hands cross the country, reach for the blue. And when we get together, it's a taste that's clean and true. So when you call, when you call. then you call. Major League Baseball leads off in May here on the Sports Network. We'll follow the Jays out on the West Coast and track the Expos through the East. TSN will offer a total of 16 Jays Expos games you can't see anywhere else. As well, the TSN Baseball excitement includes an additional five Saturday afternoon games from both the Major Leagues. That's a total of 21 games. On deck, the Expos and Reds, live from Cincinnati, Tuesday, April 29th. Game time, 7.30 p.m. Eastern, here on TSN. 23 laps to go, white knuckle time here at Road Atlanta and this 500 kilometer dash for Camel GT cars. There you see the number 63 car of Jim Downing and John Mapucci. Downing, the defending Camel Lights champion, hoping to defend that title with a win here, which would be his first win of the year. There's the number 80 car of Mograti and Finotto. But here is our leader on pit road, and Bill, that answers our question about gas mileage among the leaders. 
Well, I would suspect this is just going to be a quick stop for a splash of gas. I don't even think they'll take on a full tank at this point because they don't want to put any more weight in the car than absolutely necessary. But Sarah Vandermeer is getting out of the car. Now, this really is a shock. Why Sarah is getting out, I, I don't know at this point. I think it would have been a normal expectation to see him remain in the car for what is really going to be a very brief stint to the end. Here comes John Paul Jr. Doc Bundy is going to have to get that car off pit road or he will lose the lead to John Paul Jr. Oh, Here he comes. Tremendous. But the Corvette is back underway. Doc Bundy is making his way down pit road. Only the straightaway separates Doc Bundy and the leading Corvette from this man, John Paul Jr. in the second place, Buick Hawk. Paul Jr. making his way up through turn one, the uphill to turn two. Perhaps we can get a look at our leader and give you some idea of the differential between first and second place. That's the second place car, and there goes the Corvette. That gives you some idea of how close together they are with 20 laps or so remaining in this race. The Corvette of Doc Bundy being trailed by the Buick Hawk of John Paul Jr. Well, what a dream for fans at this point to get two drivers of this talent, cars like this, and just a few laps remaining in this particular race. It's just, it's a perfect setting. You really couldn't ask for anything better. There is Bundy, there is Paul Jr., and he is making up time. John is definitely closing at this point. He is becoming closer every single corner. He's really charging. Now, as you pointed out, Bill, there may be a, a close to a full fuel load in that Corvette, which makes him a lot heavier and a lot harder to handle. Yeah, I'm wondering what, what John is doing at this point as far as fuel mileage and just, just how much they've turned up the boost on that car. Overcoming traffic now. A neat pass for the Corvette. Well, lots of traffic now. Oh, what is, now, this is going to benefit John. Doc is not going to be able to get through this traffic as cleanly as he wants. John has clear track between he and Doc and should be able to close up that extra little bit. Corvette moves to the inside, overtaking the Jaguar first. That's the 44. No, Doc is going to get blocked here, and that's going to cost him a little bit more time. John should be able to get right up. Look at that. Whoa, he's get right in his tail. Paul Jr. almost has traffic problems there, running up on the back of John Mafucci in the Camel Lights car. Looked like Paul Jr. wanted to take a look to the inside there of Doc Bundy, but couldn't get by. Unbelievable. Here comes traffic. Jaguar in the spot. Whoa, and the 80 car moves into the racing line in front of Bundy. The number 80 almost hit the 44 Jag at that point. Oh, boy, these folks need to make way. Our leader's coming through. John Paul Jr., there this. is the Corvette and the Buick. One and two. You couldn't get any closer than this, folks. John may take a stab up the inside here. He's going to... The inside. John no. Paul Jr. may be passing. Brake lights come on. And no, Doc no. Bundy shuts the door. Doc Bundy holding off John Paul Jr. We have no idea what Jr.'s fuel situation is. Certainly, we know that Doc Bundy should have enough fuel to get him to the finish. The question is, can John Paul go all the way as well? Down the back stretch they go possibility at this stage. I believe John will have to make one more stop for fuel, and maybe he doesn't... Look at oh, this! Paul Jr. up on the grass. That's oh. the number two car, the Leon Fish car, driving John Paul Jr. up onto the dirt. Oh, scary moment. John will be definitely over 200 miles an hour at that point. Drop the fuel on the dirt. You can't believe the sensations that go through your mind. Doc Bundy continues to lead John Paul Jr. as they head into turn one and more traffic. As I was about to say, I think what may be happening here is that John might want to stay behind Doc and just fill his mirrors up with RC Cola. Oh, too wide there as Mufuji gets a close look at Doc Bundy in the Corvette. Another car in front. Bundy gets by. Here comes John Paul Jr. With John knowing he has to make one pit stop, if he can force Doc into making a mistake, that would equalize the pit stop. Even if Doc is only off the track for a few seconds, that would offset John's pit stop. And maybe this is what he wants, rather than make a pass. If he can't do it, a pit stop now for the Buick Hawk team would seal the victory for the Corvette. Assuming no problem with Doc Bundy's car. And thus far, they've had no problem. They've had all the power and speed. They've needed it when they needed it. There you see the differential. John Paul now backing off some. In fact, he seems to be going a lot slower than the vet. Well, I just wonder if something's happened to the car or if he's decided that maybe he can't pressure Doc into a mistake and doesn't want to make a mistake himself. Could be the fuel light blinking as well. These tanks don't run dry quickly. We'll find out in a moment. There's Doc Bundy out front. John Paul Jr. second. We'll be back for the conclusion. Boom, oh, hell it thanks. Vancouver. You're watching the nation's music station. Much music. In stereo. For the hottest sounds. And all the fun of live TV. The winner walks off with the one and only Mr. T Air Freshener. Much music is the place to be. You don't think you can get me that easily. I'm still here. And much, be much music. You gonna say nice things about me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Become a better Very person. Much. Get more much music. You want more much music? You got it right here.
Welcome to the Bridgestone Arca demonstration cruise. Stand by for acceleration. Arca is optimally contoured to the shape of a rolling tire for a smoother ride and improved fuel economy. Please note the superior steering position and the tight, secure cornering. What surface braking distance? Significantly shorter than ordinary radial tires. All projections indicate our car to be ideally suited to your personal vehicle. We recommend you switch to Bridgestone. Backboard to backboard, TSN continues the excitement and thrills of NBA playoff action. The Celtics are playing great ball and the Lakers are stronger than ever. But the championship is open and in playoff action, anything is possible. Join us for our next exciting NBA playoff game Friday, May 2nd, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern here on TSN. We're back at Road Atlanta with just a couple of laps to go in this IMSA Kemmel Grand Prix event. There is your second place car, John Paul Jr. in the Buick Hawk, trying desperately to overtake the bull sitting Corvette of Doc Bundy. And at this point, Bill Adam, it appears that John Paul Jr. is leaning that car out a little bit. Well, unquestionably, the, the lead is again stretching. And I think what John has done is to maybe see that fuel light, realize that he does have to make a stop. There's no way to get around that, and just back off that tiny little bit. That would certainly be a disappointment for this car. John Paul Jr. campaigned this car for an entire season last year without a finish, much less a victory, and here he comes onto pit road. Just a couple of laps to go, and it's heartbreak time for John Paul Jr., but by the other token, Bill, it, it, it has to be a, a, a happy note for them as well. If they can just hold down second place, it would be a victory for them. Oh, definitely. It's, it's really bittersweet at this point, because you're, you're happy the car is still running, the crew feels great. This, this is their gratification where they can see uh, their days and weeks and months of hard work come to fruition. They have got a racing car that's finishing the race in second place, and they're pleased with this. Oh, John Paul Jr. nearly falling there on pit road, talking about disaster. But he seems to be healthy and underway, and at this point, he's got to be thinking about holding down second place. If nothing happens to the Corvette, John Paul Jr. has still got Al Holbert breathing down his neck in the Porsche. Yes, and here's here's our leader again. Doc is just going on. At this point, both Doc and John are hearing an awful lot of sound. They're hearing noises that really don't exist. But you're so afraid of a break. You've gone through so much frustration before that you just you're almost afraid to think about the possibility of doing it. There is Doc Bundy, who used to teach at a driver's school right here at Road Atlanta. He lives just a couple of miles away in Gainesville, Georgia, on the shores of Lake Lanier. His first stint in this car under racing conditions because of break kitchen earlier events with two laps to go as you see uh, doc bundy never had a chance to drive this corvette under race conditions and here sarah vandemurva having gotten out doc bundy may take the corvette to its first victory well what a real dream come true for as far as doc is concerned to give this car its first ever victory and do it on his home track you couldn't ask for a happier man right now now the preliminary reports are that Cyril Vandermeer was was not well strapped in during his second driving stint, and he developed a very sore neck with about 20 laps to go. That apparently is why he got out of the car and got Doc Bundy into it. Two driver changes, four different drivers, as it were, in this car, and yet they still, in a very short endurance race, have been able to maintain the lead. That says a lot about this car. It really does. I just just noticed there as Doc came onto the straight, he's entering the straight one gear higher than he has to. That means that he's just keeping the RPM on the motor a little bit lower, really trying to baby the car at this point. You can't back off too much because you don't want your concentration to last. All too frequently when you start driving at a 70 or 80 percent capability, you make little mistakes, and this is something that Doc does not want to do. But he has been very, very careful with the car, and he won't put that car to any risk at all with only one lap to go. One lap to go, two and a half miles around this road Atlanta circuit for Doc Bundy and the Corvette prototype. You'll see a few of the fans here, a record crowd at Road Atlanta, more than 50,000 people on hand as they move to the fences to watch their man go by. This is Doc Bundy, one of the most popular drivers on the IMSA circuit. And there you see, talk about people having problems. There's the Ford Probe, probably Pete Halsmer back in that car, suffering severe misfires, both of the cars. You mentioned they were identically prepared. They seem to be having the identical problem today, Bill. Well, I'm sure Doc felt a, a little bit of sorrow as he passed the Ford there because he knows what it's like to get so close to the end of a race and feel a frustration. But he won't 
field too much. Right now he's thinking he's only got a couple of corners to go around and that elusive victory is finally going to be his. Talk about irony. Doc Bundy was a part of that Ford Pro team during his first full season last year on the IMSA circuit. Doc switching over to the Chevy Corvette team this year. I would imagine he does have uh, a little bit of a little bit of sympathy toward his old friends in the other team. Well, at this point in the track, even though he's only got a couple of corners to go, he's starting to feel the excitement, the concentration of going downhill a little bit. He knows the race is his right now, and he is getting excited. Checkered flag should be out for Doc Bundy, and there they are. Wonderful. Doc Bundy and Sarah Vandenberger are the winners of the Atlanta Journal and Constitution Grand Prix. You can see Doc's left hand up in the air. He's just he's shaking his fist in the air and saying, I've done it. Comes your second place car, obviously not getting off it at all. John Paul Jr. is going to take this car to the finish, driving it every bit as fast as he did at the start. Well, I feel particularly pleased for this team. It's my, my team of last year co-driving with John. I really feel happy for this guy. Second place point for John Paul Jr. Back in 1982, he won the championship, setting a record with nine races, a record tied by this man, Al Holbert, just last year. It's been a long time between good showings for John Paul Jr., but he has one. As to this point, Al Holbert, teaming with Eric Bell once again, will finish third. You know that what they're thinking is, hey, we're as fast as anybody on this racetrack. If not for that pit stop, we would have run this race or at least had a good shot at it. And with that third place finish, Al Holbert and Derek Bell will remain tied atop the season driver's points. And here is your Camel Lights victor, Jim Downing and John Mafucci. Downing behind the wheel right now. The first champion, the only champion this division for lightweight prototype cars has ever had. And this marks their first victory of the season on their home track. Well, Jim has been such a good competitor over the years. He's a, a really wise, a very smart driver. Always brings cars home to the finish. And last season, he proved that he could do it in a GTP light car. But the man of the hour is this man, Doc Bundy, getting his first victory in the new Corvette. First victory for the car. Finishing up his lap of honor, making his way down that long back stretch. It's considerably that slower than it was before. Indeed it is. A Lola chassis housing a brand new Chevrolet turbocharged V6. Said to be the engine of the future. This is a lap that Doc is going to remember for a long, long time. He will remember every inch of this track going around here. Who was waving? He, he's just so happy. Look at this. Here he is. He's Good waving. Wave to the he crowd. is happy. Another little ironic note following up is Bob Tullius and Chip Robinson in the number 44 Jaguar. Also a team that both you, Bill Adam, and Doc Bundy have driven for in the past. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. We're going through half the field. We're talking about cars that either Doc or I have been in. At this moment, Doc doesn't care about all his history. Today, right this minute, right this second, is the most important, the most special moment of his life. I don't know what the record might be, but there may very well be a record for wins in races run, and the Corvette, as you see right here, may have set some kind of a record, winning in only its fourth race. We'll be back to winner Doc Bundy and Sarah right after these messages. Can your motor oil survive the punishment today's engine dish out? Circulating it twice as fast, working it twice as hard, breaking it down, and causing it to lose its viscosity. That's why you need an oil with the additive that does more to help prevent viscosity breakdown. Castrol XLR, the oil engineered for today's cars. Look for Castrol XLR at these and other leading retailers. After hours of practice and qualifying, mechanics have the cars ready to go. The drivers have come from across the world. They, too, are ready. The Corvette is on the pole, and we're about to go sports car racing IMSA style. Our next IMSA GT race is the grueling six hours Los Angeles Grand Prix from Riverside International Raceway in California. Auto racing IMSA style, Friday, May 2nd, starting at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, here on the Sports Network. We're back at Road Atlanta. Let's go down to Victory Lane where Ron Kendrick is standing by. Doc, you've had a chance to collect your thoughts a little bit now since getting out of the car. Tell me about the run today for the Chevrolet Corvette and winning here at Road Atlanta. Well, obviously, it's special to us. We come in with a goal. You always want to win a race, but more than anything, we wanted to finish this race. And Early on, we had some high temps, and, and we had to deal with tires going away and that sort of thing, and so we had to be very careful with it. And... We honestly didn't have a... We didn't know how it was going to go. I think what what got us for us is 
you know, Sarah stayed so, so consistent, quick every lap, and uh, we had fantastic pit stops. And it just it kept us in there all the time. In the latter stages of the race, though, you really had your hands full with John Paul and Whitney Gantz in the Buick car. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I expected them to be even tougher. I think what happened is in the latter stages of the race, uh, Johnny was handling a couple of corners better than I was, but I think I had more straightaway speed. I, I assume by that, then he also had a temperature problem. You know, it didn't have the horsepower you normally would. For Ron Kendrick and Bill Adam, I'm Bob Varsha. On behalf of ESPN, so long from Road Atlanta. The Sports Weekend and our coverage of the San Marino Grand Prix. This is the sixth edition.